yes, we're switching to the other side of the prism a little bit, but it's still connected. Uh, we're going to talk more about the science and how cool science can be and how relevant. Yeah. So when people that I meet for the first time, they learn that I'm a marine scientist, they tend to get this amazed look on their face. So, you know, they, the eyes, the lips, they widen like, oh, marine scientist. You know? <laughs> and then I get three questions. <laughs> so first question is, how did you become a marine scientist? Did you grow up by the sea? Uh, a logical question. But, um, well, I say, actually, I grew up in a landlocked area. Muntin lupa sa labas naman. But, uh, but um, the, the, uh, I didn't know how to swim at the time. And so my, my mom's favorite story is how I was scared of the water when I was young, but somehow ended up being a marine scientist. I would not put my head under the water, even in a swimming pool. And uh, it would, you know, when we would go to the ocean during uh, company outings, we'd go to the beach. I wouldn't go into the water as well because I was scared of what was underneath. It was slimy. I didn't want to walk on there. So I, I would go into the water only if I can piggyback on someone's back. No. So, but eventually, I was able to overcome my fear of the water. At first, the swimming pool. So in high school, I learned how to swim. And then it was only until college that I learned what was underneath the waters. And I was fortunate enough to take courses in college to understand this and go out actually in the field and also see for myself what was beneath the waves. But so I, at that time, I was then hooked already because I was just fascinated by what I saw. The second question that I get is, oh, so do you dive all the time? Wow, cool, the dive, parate, <laughs> And I, I'm trying to be honest. <laughs> I say, actually, uh, sometimes I dive, but because of the nature of my research, I tend to stay on the boat <laughs> and we deploy instruments and samplers in the water and then we get the samples, take them to the lab and oh, I do a lot of computer work. Um, so the, you know, the initial look of amazement has diminished by this point. <laughs> the O in the mouth is like, hmm. <laughs> and then third question comes. So it usually starts out with Oh, I wanted to be a marine biologist. You know, I love whales, I love dolphins. I wanted to study sea turtles, you know. And so you, what do you study? And I'm like, I study plankton and red tide. <laughs> yeah, by that point, the look of amazement that was there initially, all gone, replaced by this mix of confusion and disappointment. So what those three questions, my answers, and the common responses that I get, they tell me that actually most people are unaware about the ocean and that there's a diversity of life. There are so many life forms that you can find within the oceans. Right? And those... Uh, life forms can have a very important impact in our lives. <clears throat> Most of this, though, is what's worse is that they're invisible to us. A bulk of what's in the ocean are the microscopic stuff that we have no clue about. So before I go on, I will... Uh, have a little quiz, <laughs> teacher in a teacher mood. <laughs> but I just want to show you something. I don't know if you can see this. Can you see this? Would you, does anyone know what this is? 
Huh? Well, fish, yes. What type of fish, though? Yes. See? Good. <laughs> Ten points. Sardines. <laughs> oh, but before that, so what do the sardines, do you know what they eat? Huh? Can, you, can someone shout out the word? <laughs> Anyone know? Oh? <laughs> Plankton? Ah, someone knows plankton. <laughs> or baka may clue na kasi, di ba? <laughs> so, these uh, sardines actually eat different types of plankton. The primary producer plankton or the phytoplankton, they're the ones that amazingly, they can harness the energy of the sun and transform that or convert that into a form that other creatures can make use of, including us. And they can be the uh, part of the food source for sardines, although the sardines can also feed on animal plankton, your zooplankton, right? But the sardines then, they can be the prey of the bigger fish like your tuna, or your uh, marlin, and your talakitok, and so on. Essentially, the phytoplankton is at the base, the foundation of the food web, without which we won't be enjoying the favorite you know, fishes that we, we would like to grill, and so on. <clears throat> and there are thousands of different types of plankton. So many, many types of plankton all over the sea, and they play many different roles within the ocean and on a global scale. Right? They are part of the cycling of material for your carbon, your nitrogen, and your oxygen. So here, let's just pause for a second and try to just breathe, inhale, Exhale. One more time. Inhale. Exhale again. That second breath that you took, you owe that to plankton. Right? Every other breath that you take is produced by plankton. So I hope you think of that as you go through your days breathing. <laughs> the next set of questions that I have. Anyone know what this is? Ah, yes. Tahong, mussels. Yes. Anyone know what they eat? <laughs> food, of course. Food. <laughs> What's their food? <laughs> Algae. Well, yes. So they also eat plankton, actually. Right? Together with the... Uh, uh, the other oysters, the talaba, right? They're called, considered shellfish. And the way they feed is they filter out the plankton from the water that's passing through them. Right? So just like that. And then they eat the plankton. They're not necessarily selective. Whatever comes their way, they will eat. Now, the thing is, some phytoplankton species have toxins in their bodies. And that's just natural, it's part of their biology. But uh, in some conditions, that toxic phytoplankton species can increase in numbers, so much so that, of course, if the shellfish is feeding on whatever's available in the water, then the more likely that they're feeding on the toxic phytoplankton, right? And the toxin that's within the cell of the phytoplankton, they accumulate in the tissue of the shellfish. The shellfish don't die. They're okay with it. So they just accumulate the toxin. Uh, but eventually, maybe a fisher folk will come in and harvest this toxic shellfish. And if we eat them, and we go beyond a certain threshold, we would possibly get sick, or actually even die from poisoning. Now. Unfortunately, uh, this, these occurrences are happening uh, more frequently. And this phenomenon is called harmful algal blooms, or more commonly known as 
red tide. And as you can see, the Philippines is affected in many, many places, in many coastal waters. And the, one of the main culprits for the phytoplankton culprit is called Pyridinium bahamense. But apart from this species, there have been other species coming in that's causing these red tides. And more areas are also being affected as we are increasing our mariculture activities and the pollution in our coastal waters. So these phytoplankton, very powerful, can, uh, they support our fisheries, but they can also be very dangerous when uh, the certain species and in certain conditions, they're the ones that are increasing. Now, for our research, I collaborate with a lot of people, many different fields. We're trying to figure out what makes these phytoplankton thrive in, under what conditions, what triggers them, and how do they make the shellfish toxic. So, how do we make something that's invisible, this invisible world we're trying to study, visible? So of course, we have to capture them, right? Now we're here, we have, we have uh, all sorts of instruments to get the plankton. We use the plankton nets uh, with me very small mesh sizes to get the tiny organisms. Sometimes you use modified bottles so we get the whole water column depth. Right? Also, uh, we get the samples out and then we bring them to the lab and typically, we look at them under the microscope, of course, to see which species are present and in what numbers. Of course, it's also important to know what the environment is where these organisms are. So we, that's where we deploy a lot of sensors, instruments, to know the temperature of the water, how salty it is, oxygen, nutrients, and even how fast the water is and where they're going. Sometimes, we also use satellite data. So here, we uh, get indicators for the phytoplankton using their pigment, chlorophyll, through satellite data. And then at other times, when we need to have more detail about certain problems in red tide or other uh, research topics, we set up laboratory experiments. In this case, we're trying to look at the interaction of the plankton with the shellfish in, in these controlled conditions. Right? And then part of the way we study this system is actually tied to my high school days. In my second year high school, uh, I became interested in computer programming. I'm geeky, sorry. <laughs> or I, sh I shouldn't apologize for that, really. But, uh, during the time, we had a group work where we needed to code a computer game. And this was a time before the internet or smartphones or apps. And we were, you, I used a fossil language called Pascal. I doubt anyone here knows that. And in the operating system, MS-DOS. <laughs> I don't know if I use pa yun dito. <laughs> but uh, I was just amazed at how you can type in words and characters in the keyboard, and then magically out came your computer game that we were, thankfully, it worked so we could play it. Okay? And that interest of mine carried on even up to almost college. I was considering computer science as a career, apart from biology and environmental science. So fast forward to the present, and the, the reality that you don't need to be boxed into specific fields or narrow methods. So I married computer programming with ecology to come up with computer simulations that help us comprehend what's happening to the phytoplankton and the sardines. So in these models, we try to integrate everything, the physics, the chemistry, even the geology, to the biology of the phytoplankton, and also, of course, the shellfish itself with the toxin that we can consume. 
And we come up with dynamic models like this for Sorsogon Bay, where we're able to track what's happening to the phytoplankton, the toxic phytoplankton at different stages, like including their cyst or seed stage, as well as the mussels that they're uh, causing to be toxic. We've also done something similar for sardines in Mindanao. We've put together the biology of the sardines with the ocean physics and also information on how we're harvesting the sardines and where to come up with mo models that will help us to know where the sardines are going, how they're growing, depending on their food, the plankton, in different areas in northern Mindanao. Right. So the further development of these tools, I think that uh, this is what we hope to use. We hope to use our science so that we are able to sustain our fisheries and also the health of our oceans. And for us, generally, it's relatively easy to pinpoint some of the resources that the ocean provides us. Your Spanish-style sardines, or your baked tahong, grilled tuna belly, or shrimp tempura. But consider that beyond these well-known organisms lies a deeper story filled with characters that most people are not aware about. The Philippines, it's an archipelago surrounded by waters, and these waters are teeming with a diversity of characters that most Filipinos, including my younger self, have no idea about. And you know, most Filipinos can't even swim. <laughs> so this means there really is a disconnect between us and our oceans. And what more for the invisible, tiny organisms that are present? So because of this, how can we fully appreciate our oceans and what it does for us? Even more so, how would we be able to protect it rather than fear it or abuse it? So with that, I invite you to please establish your own connections with our oceans. Thank you. Mm -hmm.